Okay, this is your grade 8 uh, pre-March break formative exam. This is on everything up until volume. Uh, for those of you who are working at home, uh, if you want to practice these questions again, just press pause, try the question, and see how well you do with it. For those of you who have not completed your homework, please make sure you copy down frantically all of the questions as I go through them today. Your first few questions are true and false questions. The first one says, if there are five planets and 20 stars on a picture, and the ratio of planets to stars is 5 to 20, or 5 to 20, or 5 to 20, and in lowest terms would be 1 to 4, and therefore 25% are planets. So when we look at this picture, we have five planets and 20 stars. But if we really think about this 25%, that has to be what we call a part to whole ratio. And if we think about part to whole, the part we're looking at is planets, which is five. But the whole has to encompass not just the stars. If we're, I'm going to make a percentage out of it, I have to include everything, which means it's five out of 25, which is in lowest terms, one out of five, which is 20%. So not 25%, so the answer is false. 20% of the planets, 20% of the pictures are planets, not 25%. Remember, it's part to whole, not part to part. I can't put a 20 here and make a percentage out of it. It has to be a part to whole. Question two says A plus B equals C is known as Pythagorean theorem. So if I take a right triangle and put an A and a B and a C here, Pythagoras did not say A plus B equals C. The answer is false, and here's why. What he said was A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So whatever A and B are, you have to square those numbers and add them together. And then you will get the area of the square attached to the hypotenuse. Question three says a good estimation for the length of a diagonal of a square, so I'll draw my square, whose area is 64 meters squared, uh, is 11.3. So if I draw the diagonal there on that square, what I really have here is a right triangle. Now since the area is 64 meters square, I know that both of these legs will be 8 meters. And if I erase this and then draw my squares onto there, or use Pythagorean theorem, if I put my squares on here, this area, which is 64, plus this area, which is 64, added together will be this area, which is 128 meters squared. And if the area of that square is 128 meters squared, then if I take the square root of that, I would get 11.3, approximately, because I rounded it. So the answer, therefore, is true. So the next question says, Bobby used the expression 2 and 3 fifths divided by 4 to figure out how much $2.60 divided by 4 friends is. And the reason why is because 2 and 3 fifths is the same thing as 2 and 6 tenths, which is the same thing as 2 and 6 tenths, which is the same thing as $2.60. So he found out that he got 13 twentieths of a dollar each. Is this true? So if I take my, if I take my fraction and change it to improper, I would have 13 fifths divided by 4. Or I can say divided by 4 over 1. And when you divide fractions, we learned that the easiest way to approach them is to change it to multiplication and use the reciprocal of the second fraction. So the reciprocal of 4 is really a quarter. So once we have it written like this, I'm going to multiply my numerators and multiply my denominators. I get 13 twentieths. So therefore, that's true. Now just out of curiosity, what is 13 twentieths? Well, 13 twentieths is equal to, to multiply this by 5, 65 hundredths, which is therefore 65 cents. So if you had $2.60 divided between four people, each person would get 65 cents. Uh, the next question says, 10 take away negative 20 is greater than 10 times negative 20. So let's just check this out. So 10 take away negative 20, I'm gonna, the easiest way I can do this the easiest way I can do this is to keep my first integer, change it to addition, and use the opposite. So I really have 10 plus 20, which is 30. And the product of 10 and negative 20 is negative 200. And is 30 greater than negative 200? Yes, it is. So your answer is true. 30 is a bigger number than negative 200. Question 6 says a cube with an edge length of 3 meters. So I'm going to draw a cube. This is actually a terrible cube, but whatever has an edge length of 3 meters, has a greater surface area of a rectangular prism, which I'll draw here, which is 
4 by 3 by 2. Okay. So the surface area formula for this, since there's six faces that are each a square, we're going to use the formula 6 multiplied by side squared. Since the edge length or the side length is 3, we're going to put that. Since I'm running out of room, I'm going to go sideways here. 6 times 9, because 3 squared is not 6, it's 9. And therefore, the surface area of that particular cube would be 54 meters squared. The other one, we actually have six faces. We have two rectangles that make up the front and the back. We have two rectangles that make up the left and right. And we have two rectangles that make up the top and bottom. The front and back are two rectangles that are each four by two. The left and right are two rectangles that are each three by two. And the top and bottom are two rectangles that are each four by three. So we have two that are eight, which is uh, 16. We have two that are six, which is 12. And we have two that are 12 that are 24. When you add those all together, I think you get 52. So the surface area for the rectangular prism is 52 meters squared. So if we go back, greater surface area with a cube, that's true. It is two square meters greater surface area than the rectangular prism. A triangular prism has five faces. That also is true. And if we were to draw that, the easiest way for me to see the five faces is to draw the net. There's a triangular prism laid out as a net, and I can see one, two, three, four, five faces. Question eight in the equation, negative five, take away uh, two X equals 10. The value of X will be negative 7.5. So really what we're gonna do is just solve this. We can do it one of two ways. We can solve it and see if it is this, or I could substitute negative 7.5 in there and see if both sides are equal. I'm gonna do it the algebraic way and just solve it and see if I actually get the same answer. So the first thing I do is get rid of my constant by adding five. I get negative two X equals 15. Divide both sides by negative two and I get X equals negative 7.5. So therefore the answer is true. The other way you could have done that is just taken your equation and substituted negative 7.5 and simplify it to see if it is the same. I do get 10, so the answer could be truth also through substitution. Question nine says, small coffee that's 286 mils that costs $1.85, also better deal, is a better deal than a medium which is 240. So the first thing I'm gonna do is determine the unit rate. So I'm going to put cost to volume, and I'm going to say it's $1.85 for 286 milliliters. Now I'm going to do both of them two different ways. I'm going to do this one by determining what one milliliter is, and then what 100 milliliters is. That's the way I'm going to run it out. So I'm going to divide both top and bottom by 286. I'm going to take $1.85. And divided, sorry, that's not a dollar eighty-five. A dollar eighty-five divided between two hundred eighty-six milliliters. Each milliliter cost me less than a penny. But we said that if it's going to be that small, we're going to keep five significant decimal places. And that's for one milliliter. And if I want to get how much a hundred milliliters are, I'm just going to multiply it by a hundred. Right? I think that's right. Did I have? Did I have the right number? Uh, oh yeah, that's right. So it would be 64.6 .6 cents per 100 milliliters, or approximately uh, 65 cents per 100 milliliters. I'll round it to the nearest penny. With the second one, we have $2.40 for 355. I'm going to do this one a little bit different. I'm going to divide both by 3 decimal 5, 5. And the reason why I'm going to do that, if you take your calculator, and you take 355 and divide it by 3.55, you end up getting that 100 without having to go to this one milliliter thing. So I'm going to get to 100 milliliters right away. And all I need to do is take $2.40, divide it between 3.55, and I get my answer of 0 0.68, roughly, per 100 milliliters. So it's approximately 68 cents per 100 milliliters. And therefore, small is a better deal. 
So the answer is true. It is a better deal than the medium. Uh, and question 10, which I think is your last true false. Is that your last true false? How many true false are there? 14. Okay. Uh, the coefficient in the expression x over 5 is 0 0.2. Normally, what I usually say is I usually say this true false to say the, the coefficient of the expression x over 5 is 5, and the answer for that would be false. But I reversed a little bit. I've made it 0 0.2. And the reason why it's true is because this is really, if I think about this, a fifth of x. And another way to write that would be a fifth of x, or just a fifth coefficient. And a fifth coefficient is really, in decimal form, 2 tenths. Because a fifth of x is the same thing as two tenths of x. So I can really divide these into tenths instead of fifths. And I would have two tenths being there. So the answer is true. The coefficient in that expression is two tenths. Number 11 in the sequence 10, 14, 18, 22, the 50th number will be 54. So when I write this out, what I'm really going to do here is I'm going to make a table of values. This is going to be my sequence number, number in sequence number in sequence and this is going to be the value so the first number is 10 the second number is 14 the third number is 18 and the fourth number is 22. so when i have my table of values constructed from that question what i can do is i can then see what a equation is that matches this and when i see that my y column goes up by four so we said the difference in the y divided by the difference in the x will be the coefficient in the relationship between x and y. And since this difference is 4, and this difference is 1, and 4 divided by 1 is 4, that's going to be the coefficient in my equation. And once I know the coefficient, I'm going to take the first ordered pair, in this case 1 and 10, and I'm going to substitute 1 for x, and I'm going to substitute 10 for y, I'm going to see if both sides are equal. If they were equal, I wouldn't need a constant, but they're not equal. In order for them to be balanced, I need to add 6 to both sides, which means that's my equation that matches the sequence. right? I take 4 times the uh, number in the sequence, multiply it by 4, whatever number it is, and add 6. So if it's the 50th number, x would be my 50, the 50th number in the sequence. And 4 times 50 is 200, and 200 plus 6 the 50th number would be 206. That's a pretty tough question, actually. Question 12, half of half is still half? Well, that's false. Because half of half can be thought of being half times half, which would actually be a quarter. Okay, so your answer is false. It's a quarter. Question 13, the product of two negative integers. So I'm going to just choose a negative integer and a negative integer, doesn't matter which one, will always be greater than the sum of those same two negative integers. So if I take those same two negative integers, will it always be greater? Well, this is, if I multiply a negative by a negative, I will always get a positive product. When I multiply them, I will always get a positive product. But when I add any two negative numbers, no matter what two negative numbers they are, adding them together will always give me a negative number, no matter which two I choose. So the answer, therefore, is true. The product of two negative numbers will always be greater than the, neg the sum of two negative numbers. And finally, question 14 in your true-false. The line for the equation 2x minus 5 equals y will cross the y-axis at 5. This was actually more of a piece of trivia for us because when we did this linear uh, chapter, we said that the constant in your equation will always be where the line crosses the y-axis. And in this case, this line, whatever it happens to be, would be crossing the y-axis at negative 5, not positive 5. If it was 5, your equation would have to be this. When it's a positive 5, it would cross the line at positive 5. But because it's a negative 5, it crosses it at the negative 5. Okay. Uh, your next part, oh, I know what I'm going to do here. Uh, let's go to dual page display. All right. Now, for the next part, we have our vocabulary words. 
and I'm going to do my best here to match them up. Uh, distributed property. Uh, actually, hold on. Let's do it a different way. I'm going to match them up. I'm going to press pause and match them up for you. It's going to be quicker. Okay. After only four and a half hours of doing it, we have the answers. So you can press pause and double check your answers here. I'm not going to press pause, but you can. And, and then hopefully that'll help you get the answers to those. All right. We'll go back to our full page view here. Single page. Go ahead. Go ahead one more. And here we go to question the next one. I don't think this is 15 in your test. I think, it, I think it took a right turn at Albuquerque here with the numbering, but you can just look for the particular question. This is 41. This is question 41. It says, what is the perimeter of this square? Well, given the area as 36, you know that each of these sides in this square will be 6 meters. Because 6 times 6 is 36. So if that's true, then all of these sides added together, or 4S, will equal your perimeter. And 4 times 6 is 24 meters. The perimeter is 24 meters. Uh, and again, we don't have a dice to be 42. Who is faster? Alan. So for this one, Alan can run 50 meters in 8.4 seconds. What I'm going to do here, I'm actually going to change it up. You can do it either one. I'm going to go 8.4 seconds for 50 meters, and I'm going to figure out how long it takes him to do 10 meters each. So I'm going to set it up just like this. So if I set it up like this, what I can what I'm able to figure out is if I divide both terms by five, and both terms by six, and both terms by seven, I'm going to create unit rates that are going to be comparable. So when you do the math on all of these, this is what it works out to be. So if it only took Claire 1.49 seconds to run 10 meters, and it took these guys this long to run 10 meters, obviously Claire was the fastest of the three. Question 16, Jane can read 14 pages in eight minutes. How many can she read an hour? So 14 pages in eight minutes is proportional to how many pages in one hour? The problem is we don't have the same units here. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to erase my one hour. And I'm going to put it as 60 minutes. Okay, now there's three methods to solve using proportional reasoning. The first one is to determine what the multiplier was to 8 to get 60. In this particular case, I don't know, and I don't really care because it's too hard for me to think that way. Uh, the other thing is I could break it into a unit rate of how many pages in one minute, and then I could get it back up to 60 minutes. That's a second option. But with proportional reasoning, the easiest method is to simply use the cross-multiplication method here. So I'm going to multiply across 8 and x to get 8x in an algebraic equation. Multiply the other way, 60 times 14. Well, I can do that in my head. 60 times 10 is 600, plus another 240. That's 840. Then once I have my algebraic equation, if I isolate for x using opposite operation, I get x equals 105. And therefore, she can read 105 pages in an hour. Next question is another proportional reasoning question. It gives you $4.40 for five donuts. How much for six? Same thing as the last question. I could figure out the multiplier. That's too hard. Uh, I could figure out the cost of one donut and then break it into six. That's possible. I just like my algebraic method. It works every time. So it's going to be 5x equals the product of that, which is $24 plus another $240, $26.40. All right, when you multiply this way, you get 2640. When you multiply this way, you get 5x. Divide both sides by 5. x will equal $5.28. Is that right? $5.28 for six donuts. Question 18 is a Pythagoras question. Fairly simple. What's the missing length? All you need to do is either draw your squares onto each of the legs. Or you can use the theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. a is x, so I'm going to put x squared plus 8 squared will equal 12 squared. x squared plus 64 equals 144. Isolate the var variable by subtracting 64. I get x squared equals 80. And I can kind of do the mental math on this because I know that if x squared equals 81, 
like a square root both sides and x would be 9. But it's just a little bit less than 9. So x, I'm going to square root this side and square root this side. x will be equal to approximately 8.9 meters. Roughly 8.9. Next question says, eight, is 800 a perfect square? Prove your answer. So I know the answer is no, because I know my perfect squares, and I know 800 isn't, but I'll show you how. Uh, so prime factorization, I'm going to take the fact, prime factor of 2, and 2 times 400 is one way to get 800. Uh, another way to get 800 would be 2 times 2 times 200. That's another way to get 800. So what I'm really doing is I'm just slowly breaking it down into prime factors. So 2 times 2 times 10 times 10 is another way to get that. Or 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 5 times 2 times 5 is another way to get uh, 800. And if I break these into two parts, so I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 2s and 2 5s. And if I was to rearrange those things into two equal groupings, I can't make two numbers that are the same. I could put 3 2s on this side and 2 2s on this side and 1 5 on this side and 1 5 on this side. But no matter how I rearrange them, I can't make two identical factors. So therefore, it is not a perfect square. Question 19 is really a Pythagoras um, question. It's asking, can you use Pythagoras to logically figure out what's missing? So if I take this first triangle right here and bring it over here or over there, and have an 8 here and have a 10 here and have an x here, this would be 100. This would be 64, and this would be 36, which means if the area of the square attached to that leg is 36, x must be 6. So the first thing I know when I use that logic is that this leg right here is 6 meters. And once I have that, I have another right triangle here with 6, 7.2, and x. And if I put my, lay, my squares onto all of those, 36 plus this number here, because I don't know it, equals whatever 7.2 squared is. 7.2 squared is 51.84. So 36 plus this number has to equal 51.84, because this is the hypotenuse. So in order for me to actually do that, all I need to do is subtract 36 from 51. 0.84 take away 36 equals 15.84 so this is 15.84 and the length of that side would be the square root of 15.84 so square root that and I get approximately 3.97 since it's an estimation I'm just going to make it a 4 and now that we know that the perimeter of ABC this whole idea right here would be 12 plus 10, which is 22, plus 7.2, which makes the total perimeter 29.2 meters. Okay, a little bit of logic went into that Pythagoras question. Your cube, what's the surface area of this? Well, there are six faces. Each of them is a square, so it's 6s squared. If I put 10 for my, surf, my, my side length and square it, I have six faces that are 100 square meters each. And therefore, the total surface area of that cube would be 600 meters squared. Here we have a cylinder. So it says draw it. So I'm just going to draw a random cylinder. I'm going to put five here, and I'm going to put five here. OK. Uh, I know it doesn't look to scale, so if, if I'm doing it to scale, I probably want to cut this off right here and do something like this. That's a little bit better. I calculated surface area. So if pi is 3, then this is going to be pi r squared, which is going to be 3 times 5 squared, which is going to be 3 times 25, which is going to make this circle 75 meters squared. That's going to make this circle 75 meters squared. Now, the tough part is this thing, this rectangle here. We know it's length times width, but this length 
it's really not an L, it's really a C because it actually matches the circumference of that circle. And instead of using C, since circumference equals pi times diameter, we're going to call that length of that re rectangle pi d. And this 5 is really the height. So we get pi dh is what we have. So it's going to be pi times diameter multiplied by the height, which is 5. Pi times the diameter, which is 10, times 5, or 30 times 5, or 150 meters squared. So this will be 150 meters squared. 75 plus 75 is 150 plus another 150. The total surface area of that cylinder is 300 meters squared. A triangular prism, what's the surface area of this? Easiest way is to draw your net. Uh, this says 70, I think, right? And this is 80. So the triangle here will be base times height divided by 2, or 80 times 70 divided by 2, which will be 40 times 70, which is 2,800 centimeters squared. That's for this one right here. And it's also for this one here. So if I'm starting to add them up, I got 2,800 plus 2,800 plus each of these rectangles is 80 centimeters by 1.2 meters. Now, 1.2 meters is really, since I'm using centimeters, is 120 centimeters. I can't use meters and centimeters. So I'll change it to 120 centimeters. 80 times 120 is 96 plus two zeros. Each of these is 9,600 because they're all the same dimensions because it's an equilateral triangle. So in order for me to get this total surface area, I would have to take 9,600 times 3 is that, plus 2,800 plus 2,800. The total answer for the surface area is 34,400 centimeters squared. Right? If you use meters, you'll have a different answer. You'll probably have, uh, I don't know, 0. Point, I don't know, some, a smaller number, much smaller number. Uh, your next question is a fraction question. It just has th uh, two operations, okay? So make sure when you do this, you do your division first. So 1 and 1 sixth plus 3 eighths multiplied by the reciprocal of 9 eighths, which is going to be 8 ninths. This part here, when I change it to multiplication, you use the reciprocal. The reciprocal of 1 and 1 eighth, which is 9 eighths, the reciprocal is 8 ninths. And then I can cross reduce here. And I can cross reduce here. 3 over 9 is going to be 1 over 3. So when I cross reduce, I actually get 1 over 1 and 1 6 plus 1 third. I can then change to a common dom. So 1 and 1 6 plus 2 more sixths, because 1 third and 2 6 are the same. I end up with 1 and 3 6, which in lowest terms is 1 and a half. Now, if you didn't cross-reduce here, if you got 3 eighths multiplied by 8 ninths and you didn't cross-reduce, you ended up with this number here, which is awful to work with. So the reason why I gave this question is I wanted you to remember that cross-reduction when you multiply fractions is a very important step to take in making your work much easier. Next questions. My brother Scott, Sean, and I are cutting my parents' lawn. Scott cuts two-fifths, so I'm going to draw my lawn. I divide it into fifths. So this is Scott did this and Scott did this. Uh, Sean cuts one eighth of the lawn. Sean and I did the rest. Okay. So first thing I want to do is add these two numbers together to figure out what fraction of the lawn my brothers did. So if I take two fifths and I add it to one eighth. I need a common denominator when I add. This will be 16 40ths, and this will be 5 40ths. My brothers, this is really 21 40ths of the lawn, or just a little bit more than half of the lawn, which means I'm doing 19 40ths of the lawn, because 19 40ths plus 21 40ths is the entire lawn. Okay. So if the entire lawn takes 2 hours and 40 minutes to cut, 
and I have to cut um, if each person does their fraction. So I'm going to say Scott has two fifths of the two hours and 40 minutes. This is 120 minutes. This is 40. So Scott has two fifths of the 160 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to treat this as a multiplication. Two fifths of 160 over 1. Again, that cross reduction comes in really handy here. That's 20 plus 12, 32 over 1. That'll be 64 over 1. Or Scott will take 64 minutes or 1 hour and 4 minutes to cut his. Sean will cut uh, 1 eighth of 160. Uh, cross reduction. If you don't cross reduce, don't worry about it. I won't cross reduce this time. So it'll be 1 eighth, 160 over 8. 160 divided by 8 is 20, but I'm just going to do it here. 160 divided by 8. 160 divided by 8 is 20. So therefore, it takes Sean 20 minutes to do his part. And two ways you could do it. You could add up what Scott did and what Sean did and subtract it from the uh, two, uh, 160 minutes. Or you could just figure it out. So Will did 19 fortieths of the 160 minutes. I'll cross reduce this time. 60 over 40 is 4 over 1. 19 times 2 is 38. 38 times 2 is 76. So therefore, Will took 76 minutes or 1 hour and 16 minutes. That was a tough question. But it's not that tough. At the start of my trip, my gas tank was three quarters full. Okay, so I'm going to draw my gas tank. And my gas tank was three quarters full with gas. I used nine tenths of the gas I had. So I'm going to chop this into tenths. I used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. That's all the gas I had left in my tank right down there, that last little strip right here. That's all the gas I had right here. Okay. What fraction of the tank remains? So really, I have, I used nine-tenths of three-quarters, which means I would have one-tenth of three-quarters left in my tank. When I multiply that out, I have three-fortieths, three-fortieths of my tank left. Right? Three-fortieths. If it's a 50-liter tank, what volume of gas remains? So, is that right? Did I do that right? I think so. If it's a 50-liter tank, how much of the gas remains? So I have 3 40ths of a 50-liter tank, which will be 100 and... Oh, hold on. That's not right. So if I work this out as a multiplication... And I put uh, 3 over 40 of the 50 liter tank. I get 150 over 40, which if I take my calculator and go 150 divided by 40, that tells me I have 3.75 liters of gasoline left in that tank. I have 3.75 liters of gasoline left in the tank. Okay, so that means if it's a 50 liter tank, so 50 liters take away the gas that's in there, I have 46.25 liters empty in my tank. If there are 3.75 liters, that means I don't have that much liter and that much gas in my tank because it's a 50 liter tank, which means if I'm going to fill it up, I have to put this much gasoline into my tank. So 46.25 of empty gas tank multiplied by $1.19.5 cents per liter, that'll be how much it's going to cost to fill up my tank. And if I take that and go 46.25 multiplied by 1, that will 195. The final answer is going to take cost me approximately 
$55.27 to fill up my tank. Now, that's probably the most complicated question on your sheet. If you didn't get that, that's okay if you didn't get it because there's a lot of different things you had to do in there. But at least now that you see it, there is a way that you have to be able to do it, and hopefully that makes sense to you. Uh, the next one is the temperature in Summerside for March 7th and March 13th for these. What is the mean temperature? So the first thing I'm going to do is add those together. I'm going to take this down. Oh, take this down. Oh, no, take this down. Stretch it out and add these numbers together. Negative 5, negative 12, negative 17, negative 18, negative 10, negative 7. So when I add those all together, I get negative 7 divided between the number of days, which was 7 days. The mean temperature for those 7 days was negative 1 degrees Celsius. So add them together and divide by the number of units. Question 24, or whatever it is, not 24, whatever. What number is this? 55. First thing I'm going to do is treat these brackets like uh, do these first, which means I have 10 take away the product of these two, which is negative 24. I'm going to keep, I'm going to flip, I'm going to change. The brackets simplify to give me 34 plus negative 25 divided by 2 is negative 12.5. So now all I have to do is add those two together and I get 21.5 as your answer, I think. Looks okay. right. Anyone else get that? 21.5. Okay. Uh, what is the equation that matches this graph? Let's take this sucker, open it up a bit. Now, the first thing you want to do is put on your graph any points where you know the exact location. So these are the ones I know the exact location for. Then when I make my x, y table of values, I'll be able to say x is 0, y is 1. x is 2, y is 2. x is 4, y is 3. And that's all I need. It's just three points to find my equation. The difference here is 1. The difference here is 2. 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5, or a half. So when I make my equation, 0 0.5 can go there. Now, alternatively, you could do it like this instead. That's half of x as well. Take my first ordered pair, 0 0.5 multiplied by the x value, which is 0, equals the y value, which is 1. 0 does not equal 1, but if I add 1, I get my equation. So this is the correct answer. Or, if you want to write it a different way, that is the correct answer. What is the missing value? There we go. My table's a little bit nicer now. There we go. Look at that, how pretty that is. So the exact same process that we went through before, we have to find our equation. It goes up by 2. It goes up by 10. 2 divided by 10 is 0 0.2. So that's my coefficient. So in x and y, 0 0.2 goes here. Or a fifth. 0 0.2 is really a fifth. So I could do it like this. Both of these would be the same thing. Take my first ordered pair, substitute it. I'm going to substitute it in this one here. So x is 10, y is 3. 10 divided by 5 is 2, and 2 does not equal 3. But if I add 1 to it, it makes it work. So the equation that I need to have is either this one here, or this one here. Either one of those work. If I substitute 840 into this equation, uh, 840 divided by 5 is... can't do it in my head. It's too early on. A, 840 divided by 5 is 168 plus the one more gives you a y value of 169. How many got that one, inside of curiosity? Oh, very, very nice. Excellent. 
A lot of work on that one. And then we finally, we go out here on algebra questions. We'll see how these go. Uh, your constant is negative 2, so I'm going to add 2 to both sides. Negative 5x equals 12. Divide by negative 5, and x will equal 2, negative 2, and 2 fifths, or negative 2.4. Is there any more? Is that the last one? Wonderful.